as we continue our final study of the Gospel of John with John chapter 21, verses 1 to 25, we come to what many people have called a kind of an epilogue to balance the prologue from the beginning of the Gospel of John. The beginning sets the stage of the Lord coming from his Father's throne, tabernacling, dwelling among us on earth, and now, the very end of it, he is sending forth his disciples to go and do his will. And uh, as we see the progression here, uh, one question that has been raised that I'd like to deal with right at the very beginning is the question about uh, the recognizing of Jesus. And um, the only thing I can come up with with this is that very much in keeping with what Luther helps us to understand, that we come to faith by the Holy Spirit creating faith in us. Uh, where we can look at something and not see it until God gives us that insight, uh, it almost seems with all the resurrection accounts that it takes God opening the heart of those who see, whether it would be uh, Mary at the tomb or in uh, cases like this with Peter and uh, John in the fishing boat, that it's only when the Lord is revealed to them as the Spirit says, this is who you're seeing, that they say, it's the Lord. And uh, until then, even though they have been with him for a long time, that they don't recognize him. There are obviously many other answers people will come up with. Uh, some would say, well, it's a different body, and some would say it's a fake. And somebody who said, well, I'm Jesus, come forth from the dead. Um, but uh, in the uh, general church teaching, we never have these uh, solutions um, accepted as having much weight to them. Um, one very interesting comment that uh, I'd like to make early on with this is a comment about the uh, way in which people have explained the number of fish that have been caught. Uh, this is subject to a lot of speculation where the fact of the 153 fish, and uh, we might just in terms of the background of it recognize that uh, fishing probably was best done at nighttime, uh, maybe with just a loincloth on or something like that, and that uh, what Peter does then is just wrap his other garment around his waist and then jump into the water so that he has that. Um, there's a passage in the book of Isaiah as well where the question is, but what does nakedness mean? Does it mean completely naked with no clothes on or with uh, just a, a loincloth or something like that? And uh, we uh, find out here that Peter jumps into the water and, and it may be that it was just that he tucked a loincloth in or something like that. and. Uh, then jumped into the water, and it's, it's of no deep significance, but simply uh, people wonder that they would have uh, fished without any clothing on at all. Uh, but getting to the story about the fish, there are some who suggested that the 153 is a number which corresponds to the Greek categorizations. The Greeks, in their typology of all the different kind of fish that were known, seem to have come up with a number of 153 different kinds of fish. So some people in the early church said, well, this means that uh, the net of the church, that the church is the net um, which is gathering all of the people, and that there are, this means that every tribe and nation will be gathered in. Of course, the text doesn't say that. Uh, others look at it and they say, for some unknown reason, it is uh, an addition if you add the numbers 1 through 17, you get to that. Some say, well, look at the uh, number 10 as a very important number and the number 7, and they, they make some sense out of that, uh, they think. Others have said it means that there'll be 100 Gentiles and 50 Jews and the three persons of the Trinity. You can see how someone stayed up late at night thinking that one up. And uh, a fourth idea is something called gematria, which takes the letters of certain words and adds up the numerical value, like the number or the letter A could be number one, B number two, and in Greek, those letters each also had a number uh, connected with them. And the uh, sentence in Greek, the uh, church of love, the church of love in Greek, uh, if you take those words and add the letters, the numerical number of the letters together, you would get to 153. So. Uh, I point this out more to let you know all of the different ways in which people have tried to read something deeper in to whatever they're reading. And John kind of leaves the gospel open to that by the many times when something will happen and then a deeper insight will be given. First of all, the man gets healed of his blindness, and then we recognize that the real issue is the blindness of the Pharisees who couldn't see 
even though they were seeing what was going on. And uh, I think it helps us also with this idea of recognition to realize that it's God who comes to us and who opens our heart up so that all of us, as we say, even though we don't walk by sight but by faith, we believe that God has opened our heart to believe in what Jesus has done. And thus, our relationship with others is not on the basis of trying to convince someone intellectually. In fact, we'll see that again when Jesus says to Peter, feed and care for my lambs and my sheep. And do you love me? And that love for the Lord is expressed in caring for others. It is never from here up to God, but it's from God in Christ down to me, and then it flows out to others. So, uh, many people have suggested that chapter 21 of the Gospel of John is actually a mission statement, much like in Matthew 28 we have, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, that here we would have as well, through uh, the words to Peter directly, Go feed my lambs and feed my sheep, connected, of course, very close with or very closely with what we saw in chapter 20, love one another as I have loved you, gets translated into whosoever sins you forgive, in the spirit they're forgiven, whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. So that we have this notion of you do something with it. Uh, it's rather problematic. Why, after the resurrection, has Peter gone back to fishing? Why are James and John there and that seven of the twelve disciples are up there fishing? Uh, it's almost as if, well, Jesus is gone, now what? They go back to their old way of life. Apart from the presence of the Lord, the empowering spirit led by the, the comforter, the paraclete, apart from the leading of the Lord, we go back to our own daily lives. And the Lord Jesus says, no, I don't expect that you're going to go back to your own daily lives. You're going to go, as the Lucan uh, story about the catch of fish tells us, Peter is told, you are going to catch men now, not just catching fish. And uh, so we have this kind of an odd connection here. We've got some uh, fishing going on, and yet we also have some shepherd terminology. Uh, you are to feed the lambs and feed the sheep. With, with uh, fishing, the catching is very important, and with the shepherding, the caring for the sheep is important. And so you've kind of got a, a, the two of them brought together, where the one of them is gather them in, and then care for them. You don't uh, train fish to be pets once you catch them. Uh, you uh, can care for, though, and have a little bit more of a personal kind of relationship with the lambs and the sheep. So each in its own way is brought to be important. Uh, the sheep, remember, were not primarily raised just for meat. They were raised for the wool. And the goats, of course, uh, that were in the flocks were going to be raised for the milk. And so You've got a variety of images that Jesus uses here. One, to go and gather as many as you can, and then to care for them, to nurture them, to love them as we have been loved by our Lord. We've talked about this all the way through. Uh, what we get at then is the whole story about the life of the church. Now, what happens after the resurrection? Uh, I might mention at this point, while we're on the subject of talking about the fish, that uh, the uh, fish symbol was one of the very ancient symbols for Christians. And you'll see that on many cars today, and uh, often with the Greek letters that spell out the word ichthys, which is the word for fish. And um, the first letter, the iota, stood for Jesus, the word Jesus. The ki, or chi, as some people pronounce it, uh, the first letter of the word Christos. The uh, theta, which is kind of like a circle with a, a line through it, is uh, for the word theu, uh, the th symbol, thus for the of God, the uh, small u, the upsilon, uh, for the word uh, huios, and the last letter, the s, for the word soter, for savior. And so that they took the letters of each word, much like we might take lb or aal, just as random letters and use those for the insurance companies, uh, all these different programs where people come up with something like uh, push or whatever it might be. Here the word ichthys, Jesus Christ of God, his Son, Savior. So Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. 
and uh, that was the first lesson that I ever learned in Greek class was the meaning of the letters for the word fish connected with the fact that Jesus said you will be fishers of men and Christians who were in danger of persecution in the early church where someone might come and, and uh, harm them if they knew they were believers they would come into a town and if you were a Christian you would then draw the symbol of that fish on your doorway so that as somebody came into town if they saw this fish on the doorway of the house they would know Christians live here and it must have worked well enough that uh, nobody was killed for it uh, and nobody wrongly put that on their uh, doorway just to catch someone and so the idea of the fish with the deeper meaning of Jesus Christ Son of God our Savior is all wrapped up in the imagery that was developed from this uh, as we look at this uh, last appearing of our Lord according to the Gospel of John we find once again Jesus glory being seen the glory is not just in Jesus himself the glory as we looked at last week is in what has he done as he pours out his life for others and so the glory for us as Christians is the glory of how we pour that life out for others which is what God has equipped us to do from the inside uh, a very interesting kind of a comment that kind of took me uh, back a couple of years ago when the uh, Great Commission convocation was held in Minneapolis I sat in a small group uh, with people who were involved in congregations happened to be from the city of Detroit where a, an inner city parish and a suburban parish were trying to work together and um, I was kind of feeling good down deep inside myself that uh, in the past years we have looked for ways in which we have provided some funding for some social ministry programs with Lutheran World Relief and Second Harvest here in town and um, the lady who was speaking from the inner city parish in Detroit said uh, it's easy for anybody just to write a check come and do something and uh, I thought about that a lot and I think what that means is first of all yes look for wherever you can provide funds for someone else but also look for some place in your own life where you are the one actually doing the feeding and the caring where it's not just all from a distance and um, what I think initially took me aback has helped me to look for where in my life am I involved also with people so first of all do the giving but also realize at some time in some place recognize where the Lord gives you the chance to actually do some loving also and to grow in that to recognize that feeding lambs means there's always new ones coming along it's not just feed the sheep that are there but there's always new little lambs and to hunger to do that to say that's how I love my Lord a God-pleasing life is not just one where we've got ourselves all scrubbed clean before God he is just plain not interested in that uh, as the be-all and end-all as the goal that's the byproduct of saying what's really happening in my life is the love the Lord poured in is now able to come out so that I first of all can say to myself and then others can also say about the church we are in the business of loving with the forgiveness of sins that Christ Jesus won as he opened his heart and suffered and died and rose for all of us and so as we come with some love for others it's not just this worldly kind of love but it's a kind of a love that is going to last forever and our ultimate goal of feeding is feeding them not with green grass but feeding them with the good news of eternal life caring for them helping them be aware of where the dangers are in life simply befriending human beings but always looking for that chance to help them hear what the good news is what the gospel is all about um, Peter at this point is almost embarrassed as the Lord asks him three times do you love me and some notes are provided in the materials about the word philia and the word agape um, I looked up in a Hebrew New Testament a translation of the New Testament into Hebrew uh, from the Greek and it was interesting that they use the same word ahav uh, for love ahavta in every one of the three cases or ahavta uh, with the interrogative form the question form and uh, they don't distinguish remember that Jesus spoke Aramaic and so in Greek as it's translated we'll find the two different words but we really don't know what the, the sense was about the difference between using those words 
uh, to Peter as Jesus speaks to him. Uh, for us, the deepest kind of love, the agape love, the one that is poured into us, is the self-giving love. It's the love that says the other person doesn't necessarily deserve it, but neither did I. In our world, we love because someone deserves it. And we um, hand our money out, and we hand our time out, and we put our energies forth for someone where we say they deserve or they, they are worthy of our action. Jesus says, if I were to look for those who were worthy of my love, I'd have stayed in heaven. No one is worthy of it. No matter how long they've lived a Christian life, every Christian is still solely reliant upon the grace of God, upon his death and resurrection, changing our eternal life. And so as Peter is now asked, do you love me? It is not, do you love me? Yes. Well, then pray a lot. Do you love me? Yes. Well, then go do some good deeds. But it's care for mine. It's not a self-centered thing at all. It's not me in the center trying to show off what I have done. The Lord says it's the Lord in the center, carrying people whom he loves and saying to us, tell them what I've done for you. It's not a love that has to put on a show. It's not a love that has to try and be very magnificent and then behind say, well, I really hate him. It's a love where we carry people to the Lord and we say, Lord, please help this person. And we have all done that. We have all found various people who have come through our life where they are the ones where we've had just that special kind of pull and that special kind of tug. We may look around like Peter looks around at John, and we may say, well, come on, Lord, how about what he's doing? How is it going to go with him? And the Lord says to Peter, and he says to us, you just worry about what you have to do. As leaders, then, we are going to have to equip others and tell them also uh, what they can do for the Lord. And so the church has the task of passing on that activity of his love and forgiveness from one generation to the next one. Uh, as we uh, come to the close of this then, what we have really done all the way through the Gospel of John is to look into the heart of God, to see that the glory of God is in what he has done for us, that the glory of God is in the self-giving love, and that the kind of life we have now to live is one where we pour ourselves out for him, God's continued blessings upon you this summer, and thank you all very, very much for enjoying and working on this Bible study through the Gospel of John with me. God's continued blessings.